Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, many thanks to Tim and our friends at um, EXA for this opportunity to present um, the Lanterns project. Um, as he mentioned, we have just recently finished off the project, so it's actually a, a, a nice time to um, share some of the achievements and lessons learned within the project. Um, <clears throat> my name is Inian Murthy. I'm the project manager of, of LandSense, and I'm based at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis just outside of uh, Vienna here in Austria. Uh, today, you will hear from four other speakers um, as well. And so I'll start um, by providing a basic overview of the project itself for those that are not familiar with LandSense. Uh, and then you will hear from uh, the different partners and the work that they have uh, um, accomplished with their various tasks or work package leads or pilots or whatever it may be. So let's not waste any time and just get started here. Um, Landsense itself is a Horizon 2020 project, um, which started in September 2016. Uh, it brings together 18 partner institutes um, across nine countries, and the project itself is titled A Citizen Observatory and Innovation Marketplace for Land Use and Land Cover Monitoring. Um, as you can see and maybe recognize some of the logos uh, of the different partners involved here, there's the full range of, um, of, of partners from various sectors. We have uh, academia well represented in the form of Nottingham, uh, University of Amsterdam, Wageningen and Heidelberg. Uh, we have some um, also SMEs represented, one of them you'll hear from. We have Synergize based out of um, Slovenia and Secure Dimensions based out of Germany. Um, we have some uh, a, a mapping agency as well. The French National Mapping Agency is part of the part of the project, um, as well of course EXA, uh, who was um, uh, right from this pro at this project right from the get go. And so, the best way to describe a little bit more about LandSense is to understand the motivation of what brought these different peoples and characters together. Um, we come from different realms, but what we wanted to work on was at this intersection of earth observation data and citizen science data. So how can we improve the quality of um, earth observation based products, mainly in the field of land use and land cover monitoring uh, by um, let's say integrating crowdsourcing and citizen science mechanisms into the process. So we really wanted to, let's say, transform this conventional top-down approach that existed to EO-based monitoring to a more participatory uh, approach. And by accomplishing this, we can, um, and, uh, by accomplishing this, we can hopefully not just engage people in environmental monitoring, but also engage them in environmental stewardship. A nice way to look at LandSense is to just see the full range of different um, pilot cases that have taken place over the last four years. And they cover three thematic topics, urban landscape dynamics, agricultural land use, forest and habitat monitoring, which you'll hear from, <clears throat> um, you'll hear from two of these today. Um, here, this map just shows you some of the areas of where we were doing this work over the last four years. And the idea was to really um, deploy different types of technologies that could help tackle environmental challenges for these different um, topics in these different themes. So one way to think about land sense is there's these different entry ways to get into the project. One of course is to participate as a citizen scientist yourself. So one way to do that is by ground-based um, observations. So within the project, we played around with the idea of creating different mobile applications uh, that would allow participants to visit particular areas um, in some cases, uh, take a picture, take a video, or answer a series of questions, with then, which then would help us understand better. In this case, an example here is um, promoting a sustainable urban development um, of, based on citizen insights and subjective perceptions of green and open spaces. And we worked with the University of Amsterdam on this, specifically focusing on, on Rembrandt Park, where we got subjective information, which, with the gen, which was part of me then. We compared what we got with the mobile data with what we got with traditional uh, approaches of being on the ground, uh, talking to people, uh, uh, back when that was actually really possible. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then we were able to relay this information to the city of Amsterdam um, itself. <clears throat> Another way to participate as a citizen scientist, um, not actually going to um, an actual site to collect data, but rather sitting at home and contributing as a citizen scientist. So online interactive, interactive mapping. Um, we worked mainly with the University of Heidelberg uh, on this front where we were validating different land use maps and with the community of OSM as well, OpenStreetMap, uh, where they're now working on creating a, a land use cover, a land use product for all of Europe, which within, 
which we helped to validate uh, in, in, in part of in land sense, as you can see here. So, of course, when you're not um, trying to get people to go out to sites, you can uh, engage them, uh, engage many more people and very likely get many more contributions, as you can see by the, the 1500 some observations that we were able to achieve uh, using a series of dedicated mapathons um, throughout the four years. Um, another way to enter the project is to not just collaborate as a citizen scientist, but also collaborate as a, as a practitioner. Um, you will see, as you will see from some of the talks today, that the project itself is rather tech heavy that involves a lot of different apps, uh, web apps and mobile apps that were created, uh, which allows users to come in and take advantage of some of these applications and services. For example, change detection. Uh, one could come in and uh, use our change detection algorithms to look at changes between time one and time two on Sentinel-2 imagery, for example, so freely available European Space Agency imagery um, to detect changes, and these changes could then be validated either on the ground or um, sitting at home or in front of your desktop. Uh, we also focused a lot on quality assurance, and this, of course, is a <clears throat> Um, a significant obstacle uh, to overcome in the field of citizen science to ensure that citizen contributions are, are robust and reliable and can, and can fit into mechanisms for decision making. So there's uh, some quality assurance um, services that were created within the project itself. And finally, there's also a, a campaigner service. So in the sense that since we are a rather large um, European project, we have the, the opportunity to showcase other people's um, campaigns, other people's uh, projects um, and help, the, help them by mobilizing the Landsense community to, to, to um, uh, help them achieve uh, their, their goals. Um, I won't speak too much longer here, um, but what I would like to do is quickly introduce uh, the different topics that you will hear about um, in the next um, few minutes here. Um, we have Anna Maria Raimon uh, coming from IGN France, who will be speaking on how we were within the project focused on integrating um, crowdsourced data with authoritative data. Um, so in that case, this is national mapping level agency data um, that is sort of the standard and how, how we were trying at least to interject citizen science approaches into the, into this uh, operational way of creating authoritative data. Um, so switching gears a bit, you'll hear about uh, another um, initiative that we took upon in this project, which is monitoring biodiversity threats um, using citizen science. And you'll hear about a platform which we created from uh, Sofia Capellan from uh, BirdLife International. Um, and right after that, um, Andreas Mateus from Secure Dimensions will, will speak about citizen science and personal data protection, um, uh, key issues that have come about since the GDPR initiation a couple of years back. And finally, uh, my colleague Linda C from IASA will um, uh, describe PicturePile, uh, another application uh, as part of the LandSense toolkit that exists for rapid image classification to support earth observation monitoring. Are there any questions before I hand over to the speakers themselves? I will very quickly stop sharing my screen and start it again in one second. I just need to grab something on a file. Okay, so uh, first off, so Anna Maria uh, Raimon is a researcher from the Elastic Laboratory at IGN France. She's the French, um, she's interested in heterogeneous spatial data quality, collaborative mechanisms for data validation, knowledge modeling and fusion, land use and land cover data production and integration. So she specializes in the synergy of using citizen science data with authoritative spatial data mapping. Uh, take it away, Anna Maria. Anna Maria, I hope you're on the call. <laughs> Can't actually see her listed in the end, so perhaps maybe we should skip on to the next person. You don't see her listed. Okay, uh, let's just jump jump ahead then. 
Ini and I'll send you an email, okay? Please do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, then um, very quickly, we will then, Sophia, I hope you're in the call. Yes, I am. Can you hear Brilliant. me well? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so Sophia Capayan is a, is a driven uh, conservationist uh, with a passion for protecting and restoring the national natural environment and its wildlife working with partnerships and communities. Um, as an IBA officer at BirdLife International, she works with 48 partners in Europe and Central Asia to protect important sites for biodiversity and people, monitoring the health of the ecosystems and raising awareness on the importance of safeguarding their uniqueness. So within LandSense, she's the ambassador for the Natura Alert uh, initiative, and now she will tell you more. Thank you, Inian, for such a nice introduction. Thank you, everyone, and um, welcome to the Natura Alert uh, discussion. So let me start by giving you some background information on our work. 40 years ago, BirdLife Partnership joined forces to define the most important areas for birds and biodiversity, what we call today IBAs. So maybe, Inian, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yes. Uh, so nowadays, we have more than 13,000 sites in the world, what we call IBAs. Many of these national inventories have been used as a baseline to define the national protected areas in some countries and also the Natura 2000 network. So what is the main challenge that we have today? The challenge is basically monitoring the sites. Uh, what are the main pressures affecting to these sites? What is their conservation status? Next, please. So that's why in 2017, uh, within the Lansens project, we started defining some of our key objectives. Uh, these objectives were first to improve the monitoring of IBAs and Natura 2000 sites to reduce their degradation. Uh, our second objective was to engage citizens in threat identification. And thirdly, uh, we wanted to collect the location of the threats to biodiversity, but also the habitat changes to produce national and regional assessments on the conservation status of the IBA network. So how to do this? We developed Natura Alert. This is a mobile app and a web app that facilitates the data collection and the reporting to the volunteers. I'm going to play now a very short video on how it works, and then we, we will learn more about the, the pilot cases in Spain and Indonesia. So please, Inian. Have you heard of Natura Alert? It's an app based on citizen science, allowing thousands of volunteers to report any dangers and threats they discover that can harm nature and biodiversity. The sooner we know about any danger, the sooner we can act to help protect both birds and their habitats. How does it work? Natura Alert allows you to upload and share the dangers and threats you discover through the mobile app or on the Natura Alert website. What puts birds and their habitats in danger? To name a few examples, intensive agricultural practices, mining, human disturbances, and invasive alien species are all threatening and destroying nature. How can you help? You can add any threats you discover that affect birds and nature directly from the field through the Natura Alert app or on the Natura Alert website in a few easy steps. All you need to do is pin the location of the threat on the map, upload a photo or video of your discovery, and answer a few simple questions about what you have found. Our team of experts will then review your submission to guarantee data quality and consistency. Natura Alert allows users to create online reports about the conservation status of each important bird and biodiversity area, or IBA, by logging three things, the severity of the threat, the current state of the IBA, and the conservation actions that should be taken at the site. What's our goal? We aim to know the conservation status of our IBA network. This way, we will design better conservation strategies to work with authorities and swiftly react to the most urgent threats. Do you want to be part of our team of volunteers? We're searching for people committed to protecting nature and who want to be part of making our world more sustainable. Join the movement today. Wonderful. Thanks, Inian, for sharing. I hope you liked it. Um, maybe if we can get back to the presentation to the next slide, please.
So if from what you saw, uh, we created a digital workflow for the volunteers to report, to validate, and to run these national assessments. We use the uh, IUC and threat cl classification scheme. Maybe you can go to the next slide, sorry, Ian. Yeah. Yes, so here you can see uh, that this uh, classification scheme is used at the international level, and most of our BirdLife partners are using it to monitor the sites, the IBAs and the KBAs. As you can see, there are 11 threat categories and uh, then there are like sub level of, of threats and the volunteers can report on the scope, the severity and the timing of those threats. Next slide, please. So I think we can uh, now have a look at the pilot cases. In Spain, uh, say of Burlife, which is the Burlife partner in, in, in Spain. Uh, so the volunteers shared their observations on threats to birds and biodiversity with a focus on IBAs and Natura 2000 sites. Uh, we got more than 480 observations that revealed that the top five threats were agriculture and farming, pollution, human intrusions, energy production and mining, and transportation and service corridors. The results are correlated with a number of legal complaints and allegations that were presented from SEO to the local, regional, and national environmental authorities. Uh, next, please. In Indonesia, uh, the objective was to ground truth the forest loss alerts that were produced by the remote sensing experts in Landsense in order to improve the algorithms and deliver a high quality alert system to the local NGOs. We had a smaller group of volunteers, but they were highly committed. Uh, they managed to validate more than 175 alerts, which revealed a good agreement between the remote sensing alerts and the fieldwork validation. Uh, we had several meetings with the regional authorities and the local authorities, and they considered that this kind of service could be a very good opportunity for them to improve the, the environmental monitoring schemes that they had, and also to involve the local communities in, in this kind of work. So some of the conclusions, uh, I would say that the consultations with the volunteers and other stakeholders were very time consuming, but it translated into better uptake. And uh, we got very positive feedback from the volunteers and also the national coordinators in Spain and, and Indonesia, because the data workflow and the communication improved and also the paperwork was reduced. So if we go to next, please. Uh, in terms of the sustainability of Natural Alert, we had several discussions with uh, BirdLife and they committed to uptake the app in their operational workflow for threat and IBA monitoring, as well as in BirdLife Europe. Uh, we are also working in a version two of the app and we already identified some potential groups for testing in the Netherlands, in Greece, Tunisia, and potentially in Argentina. We also got some funding support from a new Horizon 2020 project in which ESA is involved. So we hope that we can get working with the partners on improving Natural Alert because yeah, we, we really have uh, very good feelings with this, uh, this app. So I think this is all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions after. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sophia. Um, Ana Maria, have you been able to join the, the call? Sorry, Indian, to interrupt. Um, some people are waiting in the lobby, including Anna Maria. Maybe they can be let in if you can do that, or maybe somebody else can let let them in. So that I should work can, then. I can see how I can if I can do that. Um... Apologies to all that were waiting in the uh, in in the uh, in the lobby. Um, Anna Maria, have you joined us yet? Thank you for joining. Hello. Hi, Anna Maria. Nice Hello. to hear. <laughs> Sorry, I'm it's, connected. It's, uh, it's 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 my fault. I think I, I kept you waiting in the lobby. Yes. <laughs> Don't uh, worry. So um, I'll, um, we've actually already heard from Sophia, um, but uh, we will hear from you now and I'll, and I'll introduce you. Uh, uh, so um, Anna Maria is joining us from, from, from Paris, from IGN France, the French National Mapping Agency. 
Um, she's very much interested in the heterogeneous uh, spatial data quality, collaborative mechanisms for data validation, uh, knowledge modeling and fusion, and, and land cover data produ uh, production and integration. Uh, she's worked a lot with the synergies of, uh, of BGI or volunteer geographic information and authoritative uh, spatial data. Um, so Ana Maria, please uh, feel free to describe the work that you've taken uh, taken on board here in, in Lanza as well. Yes. Okay. Th thank you, Inyan, for the presentation and sorry for uh, for this connection. Um, so um, I will present to you um, the work that we have done in Lansens. Uh, so in this slide, what I want to, to say is that um, uh, IGN produces the large scale reference system for uh, France. And uh, recently IGN started to produce a new land use and land cover um, uh, product. And this product is um, produced by using topographic data uh, uh, for for land, uh, land cover classification and photo interpretation for um, uh, land use classification. Uh, this new product is updated every three years. And I would like to stress here that um, uh, it is not a national coverage, but um, a rather a regional one. And for the region of our interest, there are three releases in 2013, 16, and um, uh, 2019. The main issue for this product that so there are two um, issues. Uh, the first one is there is a um, uh, need for uh, in situ information in order to improve uh, land use classification, and um, uh, there is also need to to monitor changes because uh, now uh, this process is very uh, costly. So in this context, the main question uh, for the Toulouse pilot is what is the potential of citizen powered observation for updating and enriching authoritative land use um, and land cover data. And uh, to meet the objectives, we designed uh, two types of uh, crowdsourcing campaigns. So the first one is the change validation. So the contributor were asked to verify hotspots of change uh, from the period uh, 2016 to 2019 and to validate changes automatically uh, detected from Sentinel. Uh, so we use that, the, um, the change detection server produced by um, uh, Lansens. So uh, for um, here, the questions were, um, uh, for example, for an area, are these changes real? And if yes, which is the type of the change? And the second campaign consists in uh, asking uh, people to classify areas into um, three classes, land um, uh, industrial, commercial, and uh, uh, residential by using um, land use and land cover uh, nomenclature. So here the question was uh, for the contributor um, to, to say us which is the, the use class of an area. Um, okay, uh, so in order to, um, uh, to meet this, um, this goal, we developed three tools together um, with the uh, YASA. So Paysage Web, where the, computer, uh, the contributors are in front of, um, of the computer. Um, so they are sitting at home. Uh, a mobile a Paysage mobile application. Uh, paysage means uh, landscapes in, in English, um, where the, the contributors went to the field and answered to, to the questions, and also a, a wiki uh, application, uh, which allows us to inform contributors about um, uh, the data and the campaigns. Um, we, uh, we engage with um, uh, different uh, contributors, different profiles, um, if we can say. So um, uh, one of the contributors um, were part of the urban planning agency in Toulouse. So um, there were staff from um, this, uh, this agency. Um, uh, other contributions are uh, from the IGN um, uh, staff. Uh, so um, there are people who are not um, uh, uh, experts in land use land cover. So they... Um, they uh, uh, they have the citizen profile, if we can say. Uh, also, um, IGN staff where there are experts uh, from um, data production. Uh, also, some research experts. And we uh, will uh, work a lot of, uh, with the uh, students from the National Engineering in the GIS uh, school. Thank you. Uh, so concerning the, the results, this is the, the, the last uh, slide. So we can note that um, um, 
more than 130 participants um, uh, were involved in our um, uh, campaigns and uh, we collect more than 5050 um, observations. Um, so concerning the, the feedback that I would like to, to stress here is um, uh, so um, concerning the tasks, uh, we noted that um, the validation task was considered um, relatively easy uh, by the um, uh, by the contributors, uh, but um, uh, in the contrast, the classification with the land use land cover nomenclature um, was considered a difficult task. Uh, for the um, uh, contribute um, from the contributors because it uh, uh, it's uh, supposed to know well the specification um, uh, of the data uh, concerning the contributor um, uh, profiles um, it was uh, a very big challenge for us uh, to involve uh, citizens in uh, in our pilot um, so uh, we think that uh, the land use land cover is a difficult um, is a difficult type of data uh, and also a general data and citizen uh, um, um, do not see perhaps the interest in participating to, to improve uh, this kind of general um, uh, data. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we found a, a strong interest from stakeholders and um, uh, students. Uh, stakeholders because they have the data immediately data they, uh, they produce with us, uh, and also students because they, they learn uh, more about, um, uh, about land use land cover, about VGI, and about how to analyze uh, this data and how to assess the quality. Uh, concerning the campaigns, uh, we can notice that um, it was easy to organize Mapathon and it was considered like um, more user-friendly because people were together and they, they, they discussed. Uh, and the in-situ campaigns are considered time-consuming uh, by some contributors because they, um, um, it was needed to, to go on the field and to, to visit the points. Um, so uh, this collected data um, uh, was used then uh, to update and, and enrich our, um, uh, our uh, uh, land use land cover data. And we propose a data fusion approach in, our, in order to, to, update, um, uh, to update this data. Um, so I will um, not um, go into, detail, into the details concerning the approach that we propose, but uh, um, here in the slide you have the, uh, the link to the, to the paper and also to the data that was um, uh, where we used. And what, what I would like to say is that um, uh, now we, we have uh, uh, this new release, so um, we, we are able to compare uh, our results, so the Lansens results with uh, the lens use less cover produced uh, let's say by a traditional way for 2019. And um, um, uh, we, uh, we noticed that, for, for example, um, uh, uh, Lansens managed to detect 15% uh, uh, of the, the total number of the changes. It is not a lot, um, but uh, knowing um, uh, that um, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we don't have a, a lot of data, let's say, um, and a lot of uh, areas, uh, we, we consider that it, it is a, um, a, a very important uh, yeah, result. And if we have more data and more changes, uh, we think we, we can do more. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ana Maria, for sharing your perspectives from the, the mapping agency side. Um, <clears throat> now I'll introduce our, our third speaker. Um, this is Andreas. Um, he's the founder and, and managing director of um, Secure Dimensions, which is based in Munich. Um, he's an active member of the Open Geospatial Consortium since 2001 and chair of the Security Working Group. His expertise in GDPR compliance, uh, operation of services and applications in the context of citizen science has mainly been gained through his participation uh, in citizen science legacy projects such as Cobweb and of course here in Landsense and also this um, new ongoing initiative, Cost for Cloud. Um, he's developed um, Authentics, a federated authentication service which lands, uh, within Landsense, which is now being sustained via the Cost for Cloud project. Um, Andreas, whenever you're ready. Uh, it would have been my conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we already know. <laughs> okay. Yes. So people who know me know what my 
Turf is all about. It's about security and personal data protection. So if you think of citizen science and personal data, then um, you realize that, okay, um, citizen science requires uh, personal data. So there are many projects out there that need to know who the user is and they need to know what the users are doing. So, but still there are some projects out there that do not need personal information from the user. So people can contribute anonymous. Um, but if you have um, questions in the, in the trust of the data that was collected, then <clears throat> typically people um, use personal information to increase trust in what was contributed. And so uh, typical approaches are uh, creation of accreditation profiles or actually identifying individuals. So if it really matters, then a project would perhaps need to really know who that user is, who reported a threat on a bird um, sitting somewhere. I don't know, right? So invasive species, for example, is, is one example. Um, you need to report invasive species um, to the government and so you need to identify yourself. So that is my location, that is my area, I own that and that um, I'm reporting about. Then there is the other aspect of licensing. So um, you can contribute to uh, citizen science quite easily, but when it comes to, um, I wanna make sure that my contribution is only available with a particular license. So for example, a Creative Commons BY license, that means that I will get credit. Um, so that's one of the um, most important um, motivations for people to contribute, to have their name associated with a particular contribution. So not to do that, to give that credit later on, if you reuse the data, that requires that you use personal information from the original contributor. So if it just be, okay, this contribution is from Joe. Yeah? But then, as I already said, there are also applications and services that really do not need personal information. So for example, if you have a service that does change detection, so someone tasks that to give him a list of Delta objects, um, that service does not need to know who the user is, right? He needs to operate completely autark without any personal information about the user. Next. So, as you all know, uh, May 25th, uh, 2018, GDPR came into force. Um, it is a great opportunity to actually now have a framework, a legal framework in place across Europe and beyond to actually exchange personal information. So the challenge is that apps and services had to be adopted. Um, but more than that, it was the processes behind um, the actual technology that had to be adjusted. So um, if you roll your, if you upgrade your operating system, for example, or your mobile phone operating system, you notice that there are all of a sudden boxes, challenges, dialogues that ask you for the permission that something is accessed by an app. So I just installed this Zoom on a new computer and it was asked, can I access the hard drive? Can I access this? Can I access the video? Can I do this and that? And you all have to give your consent that that is okay. So um, the general principles from, from GDPR is that the user must be active. So you must be challenged, you must be asked and the user must give consent. The consent is typically context specific. So if I say Zoom can access my hard drive, it doesn't mean that GoToMeeting can also do that. That is a different context. So I have to give that agreement there as well. Then there is this minimization principle. So only that little information as possible needs to be collected and processed and stored. So these three principles must be considered when um, implement apps and services, uh, not only in, in citizen science, but also there. So the applicability of GDPR is limited to the uh, EEA, to the um, economic area. Um, so how do you deal with the outside? So uh, what do you do with countries that are outside EEA? And most recently, the country which is outside is the UK. They have their own GDPR. So what implications does that have? Well, all that needs to be um, considered. Next, please. 
So what we did in LandSense, we built a land sensing platform and within that platform of federated services and apps and everything, there is this authorization server, which is the broker of the personal information between the users and apps and services. And as you can see, and as you already know, there is this federation of the people of the partners from LandSense plus Edugain, which is the academic federation worldwide. So all the universities are connected there. So this gives the ability that people log in with their common Google, Facebook account or whatever, contribute to apps that are connected to the LandSense engagement platform. And um, once you have made all your stuff available um, and these services and apps allow users uh, from the authorization server, the LandSense authorization server to log in, then this information can also be accessed by people from universities because um, Edugain is the um, university's academia connector. So if you have uh, information collected and your app allows um, login via um, or the authorization server, then you share automatically or you are able to share very, very easily um, your contributions from citizen science with research and academia. Next slide, please. So um, in, in LandSense, this, this uh, broker of personal information is the authorization server, so authentication as a service. Um, on one side, it implements everything that is required to connect to the uh, academic federations. And on the other side, it, um, it allows um, apps and services to use well-documented and well-known standards like OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 so that the integration of this uh, authorization server um, is, is easy and can be done with existing SDK. So if you register your application with authentication only, then there is no personal data involved. Um, the app only knows that you have logged in. Next. Then there is the crypto name login. So the app only gets a UUID from you. So that allows um, grouping of contributions that allows uh, overcoming the silos because your unique identifier moves with you. Uh, independent from the actual provider, but um, the ID itself is not, cannot be used to resolve personal information. And then the third level is, okay, you register your app with full, full GDPR compliance, and then the app can get, after the user has approved it, uh, personal information as you need it. So these different um, um, opportunities allow that a wide range, a wide range of existing services and apps can actually use this. This. So the lessons learned. Well, the first lesson was that the legal part wasn't easy. We started doing all this before our GDPR became effective, and it was very, very interesting um, to see um, legal um, advice um, coming in um, bits and bits and bits and bits. So it was it was a kind of of interesting to implement this. So what actually do you need to implement if in GDPR there is a particular paragraph or something? So what would be an appropriate way of, of, of implementing that? That was a very interesting uh, aspect. Then, um, well, at the end, I think that the authorization service uh, is a success in, in, in um, LandSense and it was um, used by um, at least the uh, BirdLife application throughout the project um, for, for brokering personal information. Um, one important aspect is that you have to, to give an interoperability out of the box. So um, make sure that main, main IT libraries can actually use your, um, use your service. So one Well, Andreas, you're breaking up a bit. Uh, could be just me, but um, Sophia. You know about it. Okay. He's breaking up. You're right, Ian. Yeah. So yeah. sorry. There's nothing I can do. Yeah. You're back now. We hear you. Please. Go okay. Ahead. Um, okay. Next slide, please. So sustainability. Um, the authorization service implemented in in LandSense is um, 
on AS Lansens EU. It was used by BirdLife Natura Alert app um, throughout the project, and I believe it still is. Um, the uptake of this service is in H2020 cost for cloud, as um, um, Ian already mentioned. It's available under Autenix.eu. That basically is um, the authorization service from Landsense <clears throat> with improvements already done in the cost for cloud project. And the Autenix as an authentication service to support the open space as the open science cloud in um, from the European Commission um, to do GDPR compliant interactions between users, apps and services. So thank you very much. That was my talk. Great. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for this uh, technical dive into some of the elements uh, within Landsense here. Um, our final speaker today um, is uh, Linda C, a colleague of mine. She's a senior research scholar uh, within the same uh, novel data ecosystems for sustainability group at IASA. Um, she's been at IASA for a little more than a decade now. Uh, she's part of the GeoWiki and Landsense team and, and supports the research into citizen science and crowdsourcing for earth observation and land cover. She's a great fan of Picture Pile, which is what you're about to hear from about now, uh, one of the key tools within the Landsense project. Um, having seen it evolve from the original idea as cropland capture uh, to now for its use in many land related applications. So now uh, Linda will tell you more. Whenever you're ready. I unmute myself. <laughs> I'm just going to stop my video because I've already been kicked out of this meeting once. <laughs> so I think the internet's a bit temperamental on my end. Okay, thanks very much, Indian. So, uh, as Indian mentioned, my name is Linda C, and I've been supporting the Landsense project at IASA, and I'm going to talk about PicturePile. So, what is PicturePile? It's a mobile and web based application, and as Indian also mentioned, it started its life as something called cropland capture. And when we ran that campaign, we collected over 5 million observations. But then cropland capture morphed and it became a more generic app so that it could be used to sort any type of images very rapidly for, for example, training and validation of remote sensing imagery. Um, it was originally built around a simple mechanic. So you ask a question, for example, on the right, you can see, do you see oil palm in the red box? Or in the case of cropland capture, do you see cropland in, in, in the red box. Uh, and if the answer is yes, you would simply swipe the image to the right. If the answer is no, you would swipe the image to the left if you're on a mobile device. And if there's some uncertainty or you're not sure, you just uh, swipe it down to the bottom for maybe. In total, we ran 34 campaigns so far with PicturePile. That, that has in, uh, included more than 10,000 people and we've collected more than 15 million observations. Um, and although PicturePile didn't originally start with Landsense, it has become a key tool um, supported by the Citizen Observatory for Landscape Identification and Change Detection. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the first campaigns that was run with PicturePile when it first became PicturePile was uh, the one on the left. So do you see deforestation over time? So here we had pairs of satellite images and we asked again a simple question with a yes, no, maybe answer. Um, but you can see that it's evolved over time. So we've been able to accommodate categorical information. So how many floors does the building have, for example? And again, you would just move the image towards that dial, whatever answer it is. So if it's one, you would simply move the image towards one. And it, it's also evolved um, to collect uh, continuous data. So how wealthy is the location, for example? So some answer between poor and rich based on what you see in the photographs. Next slide, please. And now I'm just going to quickly tell you about um, our, our uh, most recent campaign with PicturePile, and this has been as part of Earth Challenge 2020. So Earth Challenge is uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And many apps and uh, participants have been involved, and so PicturePile was one of those apps uh, in, under the domain of food security. And so the idea here is to do crop type recognition from street level photography. So you see picture pile on the right, and that's just simply uh, street level photography. And it's the same thing. It's the dial. What do you see? And you slide um, the image towards the crop type in this case. And the key here is that this can be linked to parcel information. So from the land parcel information system. So it's not just points, it's actual um, polygons that can then be used for training uh, remote sensing images, for example, to produce crop type maps. But the, but the images themselves can also be used for automated crop type recognition through computer vision algorithms, for example. 
So, so far, because this campaign is still ongoing, there have been more than 600 people, 76 and a half thousand observations collected. Um, so, so that's been quite an interesting uh, application of picture pile. Next slide, please. So now I'm just going to show you some initial results from, from this Earth Challenge. So I mentioned that um, the reference data are from this land parcel information system. So that can be compared with what the crowd is labeling in these photographs. So if you, for example, take only those observations where a minimum of eight people have labeled the photograph, and there's majority agreement, which would be five out of eight people agree on the same crop type, then you get this confusion matrix. But the big picture there is it's an overall agreement of 98%. So basically, the crowd is pretty good at labeling crops. So, so that's a very good thing. Um, but there's also confusion. So uh, using this uh, new visualization tool that's been developed, we've been able to look at what are the sources of these confusions. Um, so for example, in some cases, it could be potential errors in farmer declarations. In other cases, it's confusion due to phenological stage. So some early phenological stage of crops, you might confuse maize with sorghum or something like that. So, so that also tells us where we need to, to uh, train the crowd more because it can be difficult to, to recognize crops in some phenological stages. Next slide, please. Okay, so what were the challenges and lessons learned from, from picture pile? Well, clearly people like to classify images, but it still requires engagement. So social media campaigns, media, traditional media campaigns, reaching out to networks, etc. The other thing is that many people have approached us to use picture pile for their own pile of pictures, but the problem is the workflow has not been operationalized. And this is actually quite a lot of work, manual work uh, to, to, to load, to, well, to create the piles, to load them uh, and, and to develop this for, for someone. So this is a, a limitation of picture pile. Uh, I think we also need to move away just from data collection. So we've collected a lot of data to data mining, use of computer vision and AI algorithms to actually start recognizing what's in these uh, photographs. And, we've, and we're starting that process as, as you saw with the, with the crop type uh, images. And, and PictorePile in combination with GeoWiki, this is our other flagship tool for collecting data on um, uh, the interpretation of uh, very high resolution imagery, together can create very powerful reference data sets. Next slide, please. That's my final slide. So, so the good news is that Picture Pile lives on as a new platform. So it's being funded as an ERC proof of concept. It's the Picture Pile platform. And it's really moving towards this vision that anybody can set up their own pile and run a campaign through the Picture Pile campaigner. Because this is, you can see this is a, I'm not going to go into the details of this diagram, but it's a modular approach. Um, and the, the other great thing is that uh, it's free to use if you share your data. So if you share your photographs and your labeled photographs with us, it's free to use, but there would be a payment system for those who would not be willing to share their data. And then there's also the picture pile cloud on the right. So these would be AI services for computer vision trained algorithms that use picture pile classifications. So, so this is the vision and this will start on the 1st of, of July and I think it's quite exciting. And it's also really great to see how picture pile has moved from being funded by the European Union, becoming a key tool in LandSense, and now living on sustainably through, through another ERC proof of concept project. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thanks so much, Linda. Thanks to um, all the speakers. Um, you guys truly are uh, champions of, of LandSense. Um, if I may now take a few more minutes to just uh, recap maybe achievements uh, and lessons learned at a, at a, at a, at a project um, level, uh, and then we can certainly open up the floor for questions from the audience. Um, so from what you've heard so far, you've got the idea that um, Lance, there's many flavors uh, to LandSense uh, in terms of uh, the different uh, thematic topics that we tried to cover, but also the, the technological tools that we needed to use to, to cover those um, topics. Um, so, so, I mean, one of the key achievements here is that we were able to deliver low cost solutions and, and come up with innovative citizen driven methods to improve environmental monitoring strategies, which was one of the, the pillars of, of, of the project to begin with right from the uh, conceptual phase um, of the proposal. Um, we, of course, placed a key emphasis on quality assurance of citizen observations, uh, for example, looking at contributor agreement. Uh, Linda briefly touched on that by getting an agreement from the majority of, um, of, the, of the contributors in picture pile and then the results uh, that came from that, uh, but also looking at the GDPR compliance um, issues in terms of uh, quality assuring of citizen observations. 
Um, from what you've heard from um, Andreas as well, we've been able to establish a scalable federation um, for citizen science and crowdsourcing being now taken up by a new H2020 project. And along the way in the four years that we've been able to really work with many projects, and I think there are representatives here of some of these other projects uh, in the audience. Um, and and, and uh, so we've been able to um, uh, tag along with some of their work that they've been doing, but also be able to provide um, um, tools from the land science perspective to support them. <clears throat> um, maybe some achievements in terms of, of numbers, uh, just to show uh, the audience as well, the, the project has been able to deliver 23 uh, journal publications uh, in, the, in this four year time span, um, of, of which um, we now have some 290 citations uh, from them. Uh, we've also done our best to make all of the data that we have collected open access. Um, you see the link here at the bottom, um, this uh, Zenodo community of Lancens that's been created. I encourage you to uh, visit this link because it not only has the open access data sets from our campaigns, but also all of our public deliverables as well as these journal publications. Um, we've had some uh, as a conservative estimate over 80 plus dissemination events um, over this time frame. Um, we have uh, conducted seven different pilots in seven different countries. And, and then here also are some conservative estimates of the number of citizen observations that we've been able to get um, where um, something in the order of 40,000, and, and then if we take into account picture pile, um, there's more than 600,000 um, um, contributions from, from the community. Um, some of the lessons learned um, within the project is that um, you could see that we had seven pilots spanning across seven countries, which, which meant that the efforts in the project and by the partners were somewhat splintered across these different pilots. Um, in hindsight, could we have fewer pilots? Possibly, but it also, the approach that we took was that it allowed uh, partners an opportunity to really showcase their interests and their stakeholder interest uh, in a particular topic. Uh, so we kind of had the approach of like throwing a lot of things at the wall and seeing what sticks and some of the stuff stuck and some didn't. Uh, and I don't think we have many regrets about that. Uh, but at the same time, it is, you know, that is a lesson learned, uh, whether we could have uh, gone with a fewer pilots with a bit more detail in, in, in some of them. Um, as everyone knows in the, in the citizen science community, one of the biggest challenges is not just recruiting participants, but retaining participants. Uh, the work that we have done here within LandSense, it's, uh, it's I think, uh, um, great for a demonstrator purposes, uh, but of course, sustaining this momentum is challenging. And uh, what we have found that uh, we really needed to adapt uh, to our different target audiences. Um, uh, it, it might be uh, very uh, trivial to say that, but it of course requires a lot of uh, work from the different partners itself to ensure that we're capitalizing on existing invested networks of people rather than just kind of broadly showcasing a, a mobile application to the general public. Um, and of course, and what you've also heard um, from the other speakers as well, that we've been able to identify um, some land sense elements um, to be sustained beyond the project. And so we're now in the process of uh, drafting the necessary agreements and partnerships to ensure that some of these key outputs of land sense are sustained. Some of these uh, outputs of land sense have already been uh, entered into different H2020 and ERC. Um, grants and, and, and of course uh, this community I'm also sure was quite busy last week with all your Green Deal proposal submissions so some Lansons elements have been gone have, have gone into Green Deal proposals as well and so hopefully uh, some of that will be successful and we will find ways to continue this at least via the European uh, Union and funding mechanisms. Um, that brings us to the uh, end of these um, the webinar in terms of what we had to say. Uh, once again I want to thank um, EXA for the opportunity to showcase uh, LandSense via this webinar. Uh, many thanks to the speakers um, as well. And also many thanks to the audience uh, for your attention. Um, and I'll hand it over to Tim. I think you'll be moderating the, the Q&A from now. Thanks again. Thanks everyone. That was a very interesting set of uh, presentations. Um, so we have had some questions and there's been a bit of chat going on, but um, I'll just recap them in case a few people missed them. So um, the first two questions are for Anna Maria. And the first one is, do you have some solutions or ideas for involving citizens? As you say, in this case, it's challenging gamification, perhaps, or the simplification of the task. And then the second question is, how is the organizational acceptance of this crowdsourcing approach? Is IGN now willing to accept uh, VGI and trust it? or was there a need to convince people about the quality? So I'll hand over to Anne-Marie if she wants to just recap what she answered in the chat for everyone. 
Uh, yes. Uh, okay, I'm here. Um, so uh, I, I try to to, um, um, to to answer to this question in the chat, but um, uh, concerning the the first question, is it was also um, um, it was also very uh, challenge uh, to um, to engage with citizens. Um, and one of the, the issue that we have is how to, to, to reach the message that we have this pilot, um, uh, et cetera. We try uh, we tried to, to use the, the channels, media, um, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and so on. Uh, we had very, very few citizens that, uh, that, that tried to, um, um, uh, to connect and to, to participate. Uh, and we, we, we think that uh, also it was difficult to, to have this met message uh, in order to motivate why someone uh, um, will, um, uh, will participate. Yeah, we try to, uh, to link that to the, um, uh, to the climate change and the, new, and the new laws that we have because we, we need very detailed data in order to, uh, um, to answer to the... Um, uh, climate change. Yeah, it was it was difficult. Even we, we we had some functionalities, some prices, some yeah. Um, uh, to, to that, uh, and concerning the the second question, uh, so th thank you, Muki, for this uh, interesting question. Uh, so a, a lot of uh, things changed at uh, at IGN, uh, um, especially from two thousand eighteen. Um, so, um, as I um, as I said, now um, uh, IGN has uh, um, um, uh, this new um, um, uh, goal uh, to produce uh, data in a collaborative way uh, um, with the partners. So, um, uh, so public institutions, different par partners, uh, will work together with IGN in order to produce what IGN produced uh, till uh, till now. Um, uh, unfortunately, like I said, um, up to now, IGN is not um, uh, um, open to um, to work with um, uh, with citizens because in our strategy we open the data, the data, so the data are open, uh, but only partners are um, uh, are allowed to modify uh, the the data. Um, so yeah, but. Um, uh, since now the, the data from IGN are, um, are free, are open data, uh, starting with the January of uh, this year, um, we also will work on that, how, um, uh, how to, uh, to use um, uh, different VGI, um, different sources of information in, in order to, uh, uh, to update authoritative data uh, and in order to enrich, enrich them with um, more semantic information. Great. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Um, I've, I've also got a couple of questions for Linda from the audience, which again, you've you've answered already, but perhaps if we just recap for in case anyone missed them. So uh, the first one is a wonderful achievement of PicturePile and getting so many people involved. Um, what do you know about the participants of PicturePile? For example, their age, gender, education level, previous knowledge and repeat contributions. And a second question also about the Picture Pile um, project was, how long did it take to run the 34 campaigns? So I'll hand over to Linda. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so as I said to Muki, I, we haven't actually done that analysis and it kind of depends on how people access Picture Pile. And the programmer, Tobias is here, so he can also correct me <laughs> if I get this wrong. But if we, if, if users um, log in with a GeoWiki account, we would have the information about gender and their uh, past experience and their education. But I think you can also use Picture Pile without logging in. And then of course we don't have any of that information. That said, we haven't systematically analyzed it. And it's very interesting that you should say that because we are currently writing a paper on picture pile. And that's the kind of thing we, we should put into the paper. So thank you for that. <laughs> that's made me think of something to do for that. Um, regarding the second one, how long did they take to run? So I think they, you know, they've all run over, say the last, I was trying to think of when we started, but say eight years or something, right? So the original cropland capture, it ran for six months and that resulted in the 5 million observations. Um, and then after that, they kind of were open-ended. And, and once these pictures are sorted or you know, the classifications are done, the pile is finished and then the campaign finishes it. So I think they were all kind of different times.
Sorry, I was just thrown out for a second. I think I'm back. Yes, there. Okay, back. there. Okay. Um. So um. And again, probably Tobias can answer some of this better than than me because he 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 would have some sometimes started a pile and it might have taken. I don't know, a, a short period or it could, depending on the size of the pile, of course, can also take a, a few months, right, Tobias? I think you've had different experiences. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah. So which one was the most successful? Where did you get most data in this time? Ooh, this is also quite difficult to answer. So yeah, in this first cropland capture, this was very successful because it was published by um, NPR, for example, or The Guardian. And yeah, the other piles were more yeah, cumulative. So yeah, it added together. Um, okay. So uh, I mean, I think that the, the second campaign run on deforestation was also successful. We got yeah. more than a million observations there. So I mean, yeah, people are quite keen to contribute. Um, but, but as Tobias was saying, when, when there's anything in the media, of course it spikes. So this national public radio, we were lucky to get something there. And, and in the Guardian, suddenly you see a huge increase in the number of participants. Great, thank you very much, Linda and uh, Tobias. Um, I have one, it's a kind of comment stroke question for Andreas. So I'll, um, I'll read it out and then Andreas, perhaps if you can give us your thoughts. Um, so, uh, navigating the arrival of GDPR at the same time as implementing this project sounds like quite a nightmare. So uh, I suppose the question is, was it or wasn't it, Andreas? You have to unmute, mute, Matthias, uh, Andreas. Okay, I wouldn't say a nightmare. Um, it's a challenge. Um, it's it always has been a challenge um, to involve the use of personal information and security and authentication with existing systems. So um, I think what the, the, the biggest challenge in, in LandSense was that we started very early um, when the GDPR wasn't really out there and very many people didn't actually know what to do. So it was, it was interesting to ask lawyers, so what do you think shall we do here, right? So what is this GDPR aspect and how can we implement that? What would we need to do? And they were saying, oh, okay, um, perhaps you implement something, you show it to us, we test it, and then we, we come to a conclusion, right? Um, so, but all that dust has settled. I, and I think that people really understand now these days um, what it takes um, to use personal information carefully. And in particular with, with GDPR in place now, um, very many challenges in terms of the process adoption has also, um, uh, what's the proper word, adjusted or, or, or people have sought into adjusting their processes so that the personal information can actually um, be included from the start. And in H2020 Cost for Cloud, um, in the very early days of drafting a, an architecture, we had said, okay, we need also to think of the flow of personal information right from the start. So, um, and I think it's, it, it, it's natural now to also um, involve the personal data flow into the architecture from the beginning. That was a little different uh, when we started in LandSense because the previous uh, directive in, in, in Europe, um, I think 1946 or something, um, that was just a directive and had to be put into law by each individual country. So the measures uh, implemented in different countries, countries were different. Now with GDPR, at least in the EEA, you all have the same, um, the same law, the same things that you need to implement. So if you implement a solution for Germany, it will also work in Spain in all right so coming back to your original question i wouldn't say it was a nightmare it was a challenge it was a very interesting challenge um and we solved it and carrying on in the future is is much more more easy because you already know what the what the challenges could be and you can assist um um entities in adopting their processes um, to use personal information in citizen science quite easily. I hope that was... Um... Yeah.
you've frozen again, Andres, but um, thank you very much for that. I'm guessing that was that was your response. So um, yeah, and um, that's all the questions that came in during the webinar. So I will now open the floor. Um, um, Gerrit, uh, you, you've got a question in just at the top. So perhaps you'd like to um, direct that to Inian and Stefan now. Yeah, should I ask it directly? Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, all right. Okay. So yeah, Indian, uh, Indian, and and Stefan. So you've. Oh, sorry, now my phone also goes off. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> um, so you've you've led this citizen observatory project, which was one of uh, four big projects that that started at the same time on the on the topic of. Uh, on demonstrating the concept of a citizen observatory, and you've had several demo sites uh, on uh, different topics and 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 uh, content. Um, so my question is, where do you see the greatest potential for citizen observatories in the future, based on the experience that you've made and uh, based on the on on the landscape um, as you've experienced it so far? You want to answer this, Indian? <laughs> How should that? Well, we should hear from you, the coordinator of LandSense. So go ahead. <laughs> I can talk to them. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the question. I mean, um, just a few aspects of this. So within LandSense, I think. Sorry, my my daughter is playing the piano in the background, so there might be some background noise. Uh, but looking at the case studies we've had in um, in LandSense. Um, you know, we then, as Indian has said, we threw some pieces on the wall and checked which ones were sticking. I think this is a nice example. Um, initially, we, we didn't know what would stick, and then we would now need to a little bit analyze more what stuck. For sure, what stuck was the Natura Alert project um, of, of bird life, and th that shows that whenever there is an existing community behind it, and that was the case with bird life, there was a clear need for this data. Um, there was a, a large, a large community behind it, which had existed before. In some cases, we've heard we, the technology was working as an enabler for data, which was anyway, in one way or another, being collected. That was the case in Indonesia. So um, I think the, what, in terms of take-home messages, uh, we could conclude is that. You know, whenever there is some interest from some existing movement um, um, community, in the case of bird life, for example, um, then it's much more sustainable as well because the community will will continue to need this data. Whereas when there are projects which are set up new with new ideas, um, this is always a learning process. In the case of farmers in Serbia, for example. Um, naturally, these farmers are not very much interested initially, and it's a long process. So we, we also see some of these um, pilots which we had, which had less participation as some um, you know, starting point in terms of whatever movement level or technology readiness level, where we kick things off and they will need to, to continue and, and this will, will take more time. So, Hopefully this answers a bit, bit your question, Gary, but um, you can ask again if it wasn't precise enough or whatever. No, no, that's good. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefan. And uh, we have a question from Alexia as well. So Alexia, if you want to direct that to Indian. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, very insightful uh, uh, seminar. Um, yeah, I was just I was just wondering. I mean, now that you have developed, you know, all the business cases and and uh, you've been uh, through all those um, phases, um, is there anything specific that you 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 would do differently if you had to start again? I mean, keeping in mind that that obviously uh, you, you, we would all like to uh, to see those those great uh, pilots uh, living on. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, uh, hi, Alexia. Um, great that you can join us. Um, I'm here. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's always a good question uh, to 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 pose in terms of like, what would you do differently if you had to um, start again? 
Um, I think um, <clears throat> one, one key element in terms of the exploitation and, and, and sustainability angle that you, you mentioned was to, um, uh, a lot of times, for, I mean, the example that Stefan gave for, for Natura Alert is that uh, not only was the, the, the community there in terms of the, the volunteers, um, but the, the workflow itself was, was also somewhat there. And, and it actually took us quite a while within the project itself, uh, you know, based on what we had in the proposal to, and then what we actually ended up creating uh, was really tapping into a process that already existed, but mainly just needed to be in a very uh, quick digital format. I'm quick, I mean like a real time digital format. Uh, so, so converting that existing workflow that the volunteers had into a digital workflow, which now meant that they can respond to these threat alerts uh, faster uh, was something that, it, uh, again, it, it seems uh, trivial now at the end of the project, but it didn't seem so trivial when we were trying to find the right angle uh, to, to capitalize on the way that the volunteers were doing their reporting um, um, for uh, Natura Alert. Um, yeah, and I, and I think uh, another, another element that's um, emphasized here was the work that we were able to do with um, the um, National Mapping Agency. And I think in terms of exploitation sustainability angle, I think uh, one thing that we could have probably done at the proposal stage already is really find out um, from several mapping agencies, what is their biggest obstacles for injecting VGI and, and citizen science and crowdsourcing you know, processes. And I think that uh, into, their, into their workflow, because I think that that would um, if we if we did that a bit more right from the get go, I think we would have uh, end products, you know, with with a, with a stamp of approval from um, from mapping agencies, which then, of course, well, let's say potentially, will have a greater uptake um, at the end of the project. So uh, and, and and be sustained even more. Um, so I think that those are maybe two elements to, if I were to go back in time. Um, I'd, probably look a lot younger as well, but at the same time, it would be um, great to inject those two things into the project. Okay, great, thanks Ian. Maybe, maybe to complement, maybe to complement one, one more aspect, which I think is also important and Ian already alluded to it. Um, we had seven pilots, you know, when you have seven pilots with a 5 million project, the resources are being diluted automatically, right? Because you also don't know initially what works and what doesn't work. And this was also the nature of the call. So I think to have won this call, there was only one of the four which had one overarching case study, which was the Grow Observatory. That was kind of in a way nicely done because it had some overarching goal and it was all the same thing and it had pilots, but all were doing the same. But the other three being funded, they all had very local case studies. And that was also how actually the call text was set up. But if you were, we were doing it again, I think what we learned is that if you have less pilots, um, less case studies, maybe even instead of having three thematic areas, having two, we could have done much more in them. And maybe we could have also had a little bit more sustainability here and there uh, if the resources had been concentrated more. So I, I think we would do that now now differently. That, that's much as my personal view, view on this. Thanks. Yes, if I can add something uh, from our perspective as a partnership, I think the key point why Natura Alert has become such an important tool for us and we consider it that it will be you know improved in the future and it will survive the end of the project is because of that need that it was already existing uh because of the, the partnership that it was already there so i i really agree with stefan and Indian on the importance of having a need having the partnership or having the, the community already and the commitment because really monitoring IBAs or monitoring sites, Natura 2000 sites will be always on the core of the kind of work that BirdLife does. That's why this Natura Alert app really fits with, with, the, with our strategy and why people are ready to invest and willing to, to keep working on it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, we've, we've probably got time for perhaps one or two more questions from, from the part uh, the audience. If anyone would just like to chip in, you can just unmute yourselves and ask the panel a question. Okay, it looks like we've uh, we've covered all the questions. So um, yeah, thank you very much uh, to everyone from LandSense for a very interesting afternoon and for joining us at EXA for, for this webinar this afternoon. It will be um, made available uh, as soon as we can on, on our YouTube channel and I'll, I'll share that now. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you again to Inian for, for hosting for us and to all the speakers and uh, yeah, congratulations on a fantastic project. Thank you guys. Brilliant. Thank you, Thanks. 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 Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, team. Bye. Thanks. Leading these. Thanks. Bye-bye.